Hi gang, how's it going? What do you see in the image that is presented on your computer screen that is so unusual? This is so we've just seen that the image that we produce inside of our view camera is upside down. Now, how can this happen? Why does it happen? Well, in order to understand that, we're going to actually look at the way images form in kind of an odd situation. But before we do that, I just want to show you what would happen, for instance, if we didn't have a lens at our disposal. Here's a camera. Here's something we can take a photograph of. Quick. There it is. Can you actually see that? Hopefully in focus. Doesn't matter whether it's in focus. You can see there's stuff there. Okay. Now, let's do the same thing without the lens. We'll take the lens off. Oh yeah, it really looks beautiful. Really beautiful. And here it is. Here is our non-image. All you see is more or less uniform nothing. How does that happen? Why does that happen? Well, light spreads out from a point in all directions. We kind of assume that, but in fact there's real proof of that every single time you go outside and you point out an object to a friend that is walking by you. You say, oh, look at that big airplane in the sky. And your friend says, yup. How come both of you can see the same object? It's because light that enters your eyes is a different set of photons than the light that's entering your friend's eyes. So let's imagine we have kind of this silly situation. For some reason, whenever we have images formed in any physics textbook, they always use an arrow. So let's stay with that because it's actually very convenient and it also is good for me because I can't draw anything. I mean, you know, this is, this is me, right? So we'll stick with an arrow and we'll imagine that we don't have any lens at all and we have just some sort of piece of film or some sort of digital detector nearby this arrow and we just kind of are going to take a picture of this arrow using our digital detector. What I have here is some unexposed film from that view camera you just saw and I can take out one of these sheets of film very quickly. It's in there, in this black box. Oh. Ooh, might have been overexposed. What you just saw with my digital camera really points out to you that you can't have an image without some sort of way to focus light. Okay, we take this for granted, but let's look at this. Here's our picture of an arrow. Here's our film. Why don't we get an image of that arrow when we just have a piece of film just raw exposed to this particular object? Well, the reason is very clear. The light from the tip of the arrow goes here. Some of the light from the tip of the arrow goes here. Some of the light from the tip of the arrow goes there. And in fact, light from the arrow tip will spread out completely over the entire piece of film. On the other hand, the tail of the arrow, some of that light will go here, some of that light will go here, some of that light will go here, and you can see pretty clearly that you're just going to have a complete mess. There's going to be light coming from all parts of the arrow on all parts of your detector so you're not going to get 
an image. But now let's imagine something a little bit different. In order to make sure that the light from only one part of the arrow goes to only one part of the lens, let's imagine that we set up the following. We have a sheet of film, okay, which I'm going to kind of imagine is oriented in this plane between the camera and the blackboard. And in between the sheet of film or our digital detector, we're going to just place a little pinhole. And for that pinhole, maybe I'll use a different color chalk. Okay, so we have a little tiny hole in the middle between the arrow and our detector. And let's in fact label this. Here's our object. And now, look and see what happens to the arrow tip. The arrow tip light can come through the hole in the pinhole. And now you see that all the other rays of light coming from the tip of the arrow are blocked. So the only place that the tip of the arrow will show on our detector is down here. And we will see eventually if we were to turn that film in the direction so we could see it, an image of the tip of the arrow. Also, light from the tail of the arrow. That will go through our pinhole, sit over here, okay? And all the other rays of light that might have affected our detector in an adverse manner as far as not allowing any image to form will be blocked by our pinhole. And now we'll see that we'll end up with the tail of the arrow and of course all the intermediate parts of the object will also travel through the pinhole and form their appropriate place on our detector. And lo and behold, we have an upside down image. Now, one of the big disadvantages of a pinhole is that it's a pinhole. There's just a little teeny amount of light going through that. Wouldn't it be great if instead of wasting all of the light that gets blocked by the pinhole, we could actually use that light and form an image with many, many more photons and therefore in a much shorter period of time? Well, that's exactly what a lens does. It's really, in a certain sense, a collection of little pinholes, the pinholes of which are arranged so that all of the light comes to focus on a single point. And that's the key for formation of an image. So you can see it's absolutely inevitable that we end up with an image that's upside down if it's a real image, if it's something that has energy associated with it. Okay? There's another way to form an image, and that is using a curved mirror. And rather than using my terrible artwork to do this, we'll actually return to our computer station and see how mirror images work when we use a curved surface. And keep in mind when we do this 
that there are going to be differences between these mirrors, which are mirrors that are curved, and the images that you get when you stand in front of your mirror in your room and look at yourself. You're obviously right side up in that mirror, or at least in the same upside down sense that the brain kind of flips around and all of that stuff. And like, how come the brain doesn't flip the view camera image upside down if it's upside down? And it's supposed to flip everything that's upside down right side up? You've got your view camera image upside down. Why isn't it right side up? Good question. One other thing I might add is there are limitations that we have currently with lenses. And let's draw a lens so we can actually see what some of those limitations are. Instead of our pinhole, we have a lens that is now going to serve the same purpose as our pinhole, but allow all of the light, or at least more of the light, to kind of come through and get focused at the proper place Whoops, not very good. The point is, and this is the thing the takeaway from this, is that the lens is very thin at the edges. It's very, very hard to make a large piece of glass that is thin around its circumference. And in fact, this is the primary reason, or one of the primary reasons, why refracting telescopes that use lenses instead of mirrors are limited and are currently the largest refracting telescope in existence is just about 40 inches in diameter. And a new one that size hasn't been built in many, many years. You might say, why do we need the lens shaped like this? Well, in fact, it's the lens being shaped like this that allows all of the light to somehow know where to go. And this has to do with a principle called the principle of least time that Pierre Ferma thought about a very, very long time ago. And it's part of the way that our modern lenses for cameras are designed today. But very recently, people have started thinking about the possibility of making a flat lens. And the way you do that is a very strange idea that has to do with the way light bends as it goes through an object. And what I will do is post some references to this type of situation, this type of phenomenon, in which people are trying to make very, very large lenses. So you can see, or you ought to be able to see, that the larger the diameter of the lens, the more light you can gather. And that really is the reason for having large telescopes. If we can somehow get images formed in a way that allows us to gather even more light than is currently possible from a particular object in space, we will be able to do astronomy even more efficiently than we can do it today.